So um, I have a tendency to start by apologies. So I'll, I'll apologize for a not understanding anything about what I am Israeli. What can I do? So I don't understand control theory, although I'm supposed to understand a bit of it. But I know enough so to know that I don't really understand it. Um, I don't really understand biology, and computer science is something I used to know. Um, and since this is a kind of an interdisciplinary audience, uh, I, I thought I'll start with a warning, and then we'll get to the actual subject, which I don't know how it relates to, the, to whatever people care about. So I used to be a computer scientist, and, and as Naima introduced me, when the computer science department hired me, I didn't know anything about biology and wasn't that interested either. Uh, but I was a data analysis person. Um, and one of the things is that in biology, people start correcting data. So it was nice to look at that kind of data and have some real life data rather than simulated data or artificially generated data and so on. So it was cool. But then you start looking at the data and find things. And you know, naturally, you want to do something with it. And you start reading the description on some of the columns. And you get kind of questions of, you know, things that uh, if I would have learned biology in high school, maybe I could have known. Um, and th but then you start to learn through not reading, but rather by, I call it osmosis. I don't know if it's the right thing. You notice that you say something and everybody perks up, and you say something else and everybody is like falling asleep. And so you start realizing what the crowd is attuned to. And at some point, you notice that you can sell anything by, to anyone by mentioning certain things. And then you start to read the literature to look for more data. So you start looking at the top journal for you know, key people that publish a lot of data. Um, but then you already understand something. So you start to say things like, ah, like you know, I surely got the right data because it doesn't behave as, as you pretend. So by now, you're not so innocent. And you start being argumentative, argumentative with your collaborators and tell them not to do things the way they do it. And from here, the, the road to saying something like this is very, very short. You know, you should do this and should do that. And then, you know, who moved my pipe? pipe? So uh, beware, because there is no turning back once you, you go there. Um, so I'm, I'm here. In fact, I stopped using the pipe at the moment I established the lab and let other people do that. But I, I worry about issues that have to do I didn't think 10 years ago I would worry about the quality of the media or who, where's the autoclave and why is it busy all the time and things like that. OK, so what are we, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about something completely different than what we heard so far. It's about the very, very molecular level of transcription. Uh, Rich mentioned transcription in E. coli. I'm going to talk about transcription in Okaryotics, where things are much more complicated due to the fact that the genome is packed. So we have very long DNA sequence. It's being packed at multiple levels. We, if you remember your high school biology, if you remember that there are chromosomes you can see by microscope. And those are made of, of proteins that are mixed together with the DNA. And the, the smallest unit that I will focus only on it is something called the nucleosome. It's a complex of eight proteins. They are called histones. So I'll mention nucleosomes and histones, and we'll go back and forth. Nucleosome is histone plus DNA. So hopefully, we will not confuse. The nucleosomes are those histones with about 150 base pairs of DNA wrapped around them. They form small beads. And that's like providing the first level of compaction. There is much more than that, but we'll talk right now only about this. Um, so aside from compacting, the, the minute you start talking about compacting, you realize that you also have to manage the, the packaging. And in, to some extent, everything that happens with the DNA has to touch or interface with the chromatin. And chromatin plays a central role in many things. If you talk to people who care about DNA repair and cancer-related things, a lot of the things that happen to fix the DNA involve the chromatin around the area of the breakage. When you think about replicating your DNA, you have to repack the new, nu the new DNA, the newly, newly synthesized DNA. And again, a lot of things are happening there. But I'm going to talk about the interface between transcription, which is the process of reading out the DNA, and the packaging. And 
It's very classical results show that if you take a DNA and add nucleosomes somehow, and it's not so easy, so it's harder than it sounds, nucleosomes serve to stop transcription. The intuition is you have a competition between packing the DNA around the nucleosome versus somebody opening it up and synthesizing RNA. So there is a basic tension between those two processes, but they coexist. So how do they coexist? So if we look at more refined statement, so and we look at two DNA strands that schematically can be packed, and there is one difference in the packing. These are nucleosomes here. It exists, and here it doesn't. The removal of this nucleosome might open up the DNA for recognition by other proteins that bind DNA. In particular, this purple one is supposed to simulate, to designate a, a protein that activates transcription. It recognizes the DNA there, binds, brings along its friends, and there is transcription of this gene. On the other hand, on this copy of the DNA, this recognition site is hidden by the nucleosome, and nothing happens. Okay? So that's a very simple way of thinking of the packaging as something that regulates accessibility or activity of the underlying DNA sequence. And if we would stop here, we can already can have an interesting discussion of where the nucleosomes are, who moves them, and so on. But things get much more interesting. This view of a nucleosome as a very uniform coin or you know, beads that are all the same is actually wrong. Those beads can be marked by multiple things. I never learned chemistry, so I have no idea what methylation versus acetylation. For all we care about, those are different bits of information you can plug in on top of this. You don't have to understand the chemistry. Well, you actually do have to understand the chemistry, but for now, let's leave it aside. So the important from our perspective is that those modifications are coval covalently bound. So these are not temporary things. Those are things that are put there by enzymatic reactions, and they stay. And so you can mark nucleosome by different flags, and we'll see in a second the amount of flags, but that means that the nucleosome already is a layer that we can write, right? We can come and say that this nucleosome looks very different than that one. And that may influence processes that happen at the DNA level. So one analogy is that if the DNA is like a CD-ROM, it's like totally unmutable, which again is a lie, but more or less unchangeable during the life of the organism, the chromatin, the packing of the DNA actually is mutable, and we can put temporary marks there. And one of the big questions is how fast, how long do they last? But we can think of these as ways of storing information above the genome in a very trendy term to use today is epigenome, information above, beyond the genome. Um, it's a, I'll try to stay away from that term because it has possible connotation, but one of the problems is how stable this information. So stepping in and looking a bit closer at this, this is uh, from a recent review. It's already outdated. These are a schematic of the four types of histones that make a nucleosome. They're called, four and three make sense, 2A and 2B doesn't, but one is something else. So we have 2A, 2B, 3 and 4. Those are the four histones. And they form some kind of structure which is actually functional for the DNA looping. But the interesting bits for us are things that are unstructured. Supposedly, in, when you talk about protein, the unstructured part are usually kind of you know, linkers or fillers or something like that. But in this case, the unstructured parts are very well conserved throughout the Okorotic Kingdom. And all the places where you see those dots are places that can be modified by different marks, acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, simulation, ubiquitinations, and many other Asians. Um, so, as a computer scientist, I look at this and I say, oh, there are 35 bits of information that can be encoded on a single nucleosome. In fact, it's more than that because some of those marks can be uh, manipulated once, twice, or twice, so it's already two bits. And moreover, we have two copies of each of those 
proteins in the nucleosome. So take the number here and multiply. So there is potentially space to encode a lot of information here. But the potential to write information is not enough. You need somebody to write it and you need somebody to read it. So in fact, there is a large collection of proteins that have been implicated to do reactions that put, put mark, remove mark. So you have acetylases, deacetylases, methylases, demethylases. With phosphate, it's actually phosphatylases and phosphatases, so it's not the same. You don't have the D, but you get the picture. So there are enzymes that can put those things. And in fact, some of them are really specific. So there is an enzyme that does methylation only of this mark. It's a lysine. There is another lysine here, but it, doesn't, it only methylates lysine 4. So it's a specific writer for a specific position. And there are readers. What are readers? Readers are proteins that can recognize only a modified state. So there is a protein domain. It's not the whole protein. It's just part of the protein that recognizes K4 trimethylase. So only if this lysine is trimethylated, this protein will bind. Again, it's a lie. It has a much higher affinity to this state than to the basal state. So we have, in a sense, all the machines that are needed to store information and read it. Uh, I'll mention one, two more facts that are not on the slides because I realized um, as I was giving the talk is A, these things are super conserved. So if, you, uh, if we look at a very simple eukaryotic organism and find an enzyme that, say, the, the H3K4 methylase, I'll use this example a lot, you'll find exactly the same protein conserved all the way to organisms such as ourselves. It might have several paralogs, copies of that enzyme in humans that work in different tissues. But basically, the machines that we find are super highly conserved. This usually means in biology that they are super important. The second is that I mentioned that nucleosomes are temporary memory, and I mentioned erasers. There is also another class of, of enzymes that I didn't put on the slide here, but are important to remember. They just come along and remove a nucleosome and just send it to this recycling bin. So there's also another process. Your packing material gets re your DNA gets repacked at certain stages, and you get a complete reset of whatever information you wrote. So the, the life of these marks is maybe not controlled just by simple eraser, but also by resetting. OK. The buildup when you read about all of this is that there is tons of information coded in this epigenetic information. But when you go and look, and people have been doing this the last 10, less than 10 years, been looking at genome-wide at the patterns of these marks, they find things that look like that. S very stereotypical marks. So I mentioned, we'll use this term for somebody who actually bothers to read the term, histone 3, lysine 4, lysine in K. It takes a while to learn this. 3 methylated. So three methyl groups were added. We find that at the beginning of active gene. Another three methylation, but of lysine 36, appears along the body of the gene. This sounds to you, OK, I'm oversimplifying. Yes, I am oversimplifying. But if you look at the piece of the genome, and so the x-axis is the genome, the height is the amount of signal we find when we do, when people map those things. Here is a gene. Here is the. The gene goes the opposite direction, the green, the blue. Same for this gene. In fact, they use this signature to find other genes that they didn't know about beforehand. So the signature for these two marks is very stereotypical along the gene, which actually, when I first ran to it today, it's OK, yeah, sure. But when you think about it, it's totally non-trivial. Somebody went, took the genome. It's a genome sequence. And marked where all the genes are, right? So you don't need to read the genome in order to, to know here is a gene. We find genes usually by reading the genome structure and finding all kinds of patterns in the DNA sequence. But the cells somehow already marked them. 
by other marks. And in fact, almost all of the marks we see, except few that are, that are associated with DNA repair, for example, and only appear near breakpoint and things like that, are stereotypically related to gene structure. Either the beginning of the gene, the end of the gene, throughout the gene, in active genes only or in genes regardless of their activity level, but most of, I'm, I'm, we can quantify it, 80% of the signal you'll find in such genome-wide studies can be dealing, reduced to two axes where you are along the gene and whether the gene is active or not in the cells you will measure, which is very, very disappointing. I told you there are some tens or dozen numbers of bits encoding this information, but I told you now that there are only two directions that I can uh, look at things, which is basically, our, am I at the beginning of the gene or the end of the gene or at the regulatory region? Why so little is encoded? So there are two options. One is that we are looking at a system that will reach a stable point. Most people who do these things take cells, they're growing in the plate or the dish or whatever, and they collect them and measure. In doing so, they, they look at a certain kind of, a, I'm talking to a crowd of people who are engineers, so I have to be careful, it's not a steady state, but it's a kind of a pseudo steady state, okay? So maybe all of those things are establishing one after the other, but we are taking a static snapshot and we see already the end effect of those things and we don't see the transient state. The other option is that there is a lot of redundancy and that's why we see these things co-occur so much. So the big question we're trying to ask is how the system work and in particular how do the two processes I started with, transcription and chromatin, work? So all of these things are suggestive that chromatin marks really care about transcription because the fact that they are associated with genes is highly suggestive that this is, has something to do with transcription. So what's the relationship? So let's talk about the, the two players. So I, I gave an introduction to chromatin. I assume transcription, you know, transcription is somebody comes along, decides that the gene should be activated, calls, or, you know, Paul 2 come over here, please start transcribing. Paul 2 goes through the gene. Something tells it to stop sometime. We don't really understand always why and we get messenger RNA, okay? In doing so, Paul 2 has to open the DNA and do all kinds of synthesis along this template. So what do we know about the relationship between those? We do know that transcription affects chromatin. Many of the enzymes that put marks, like the two marks that you used in the example before, are recruited to the chromatin by the transcription machinery. So the fact that the piece of DNA is being transcribed will change the chromatin mark on that piece. Moreover, one of the machines that can bump nucleosomes off is the transcription machinery and its associated friends. So it brings along enzymes that can take apart nucleosomes and disassociate. So clearly transcription changes chromatin. On the other hand, chromatin also changes transcription. We know that there are marks that are essentially repressive. You put those marks, you say this piece of DNA should not be transcribed. So there is, and this, this area of quarantine, which I will not talk a lot about, is really actually the one we really well understood. These are pieces of the genome we store away, we say don't use those in this cell. So there, there is certainly repressive chromatin, but there are also chromatin marks that are associated with actively transcribed region, which the literature argues are either permissive, so they allow pro pro uh, polymerase to work, or actually necessary in order for polymerase to work. So just to give you an example, so this picture is supposed to say we're looking at a complicated system with a lot of feedback loops. To give you a simple example, I pulled out this thing. How much time do I have? Oh, man. Okay. This will be more of a tutorial than a talk, but uh, so this, there will be an exam at the end of the talk, so please pay attention. So here is a piece of DNA which is marked with the gene 
and something we call promoter, which is where things build up before they actually start transcription, kind of an initiation path. And what the people who wrote this review wanted to show is that when the polymerase is assembled, it is in a particular state, which is encoded by these marks, and we can ignore them for a second, that recruits a complex called set one that deposits methyl on histone 3 K4, lysine 4. When this mark is trimethylated, another protein can recognize it and bring along a histone acetylase that puts an acetylation mark on either these nucleosomes or neighboring nucleosomes. So already we see some kind of feedback. Now we'll mention that histone acetylation is usually a mark of active transcription sites. And deacetylation is a way of silencing. So already we see some kind of interaction. So this is what happens at the beginning. When the polymerase starts to transcribe, it's being modified. And this mark disappears and being replaced by another mark, which recruits a complex that is very similar to set 1, and that's why it has a similar name, called set 2. Set 2 is a K36 methylase, so it, puts, it methylates K36. Another complex recognizes methylated K36 and binds to these places and actually deacetylates all those nucleosomes. So this is the way I, I'm any biologist in the crowd? Or? We used to be. We used to be, okay. <laughs> so this is the way biologists describe a very complicated dynamic system. Clearly, from these hours and marks, we cannot simulate the system, but Let's pretend we can simulate things happen here along two axes. First time, you know, things, one thing happened and the other. And the second is transcription processes along, you know, the gene this direction. So the mental simulation which you should get is that at the initiation, this mark is deposited. And then as we escape initiation, we actually do elongation, we get this mark. Yeah, sure, go ahead. This is a mental simulation I just did on my head. It's, it's so, well, someone so is doing simulation here. We don't know the numbers, and actually, I think that's one of the issues. Because, I mean, you can build an elephant without the numbers. Yeah, that's why, that's why I said that when we say we understand the pathway, we don't really understand the pathway. We might understand who is bringing whom. And people who drew this pathway didn't tell you that this nucleosome gets reassembled much faster than this one. So this one is being turned over every five minutes, and this one every hour. This wasn't in the mental calculation, OK? So they didn't think it was interesting for this discussion. So there are, there are many issues here, but this is kind of the level of understanding we have today. OK, are you convinced that there is feedback loops and a lot of interaction between the processes? Anybody wants to argue that? There is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm missing the coping. If there's no coping mechanism, but you're basically walking, then there's no memory. Okay. Aries touches on a crucial problem, which is memory when we duplicate the genome, for example. Then some of those nucleosomes go here, some go to the one copy, other to the other copy. And the, the rest of the DNA is packed with fresh nucleosome. Who copies that? Great question. I'm leaving it out of the discussion today. I can talk about it later. Basically, for repressive marks, we know about copying machineries. There's argument about them. For activating mark, people claim that they're being copied. I claim that the only thing that copies them is polymerase. So if you still have transcription, you'll reassert them. So in fact, they get erased during the copying. We can have discussion later. But the, it, it is another dimension that is crucially important, but I left out of this talk. OK. So how are we going to probe those feedback loops? What we're going to try to do is genetics. So genetics changes the genotypes, i.e. we are going to change the set of proteins available to the cell. As a consequence, the chromatin will be different. This will propagate to transcription, and we can measure the effect in terms of transcriptions of target genes. The problem is, and this is where I hope control theorists know more than me, is that the system with feedback, if you perturb it in a certain way, it achieves 
a new steady state by compensating in many ways, and cells are not lacking compensating machineries. And many of the mutations we do either kill the cell because they cannot compensate or has very little effects. So most of those mutations, when you look at the cells in general, they're happy. Well, they're not that happy, but they're OK. They do all the things we expect them to do. They grow, they divide, and so on. So we have to be slightly worried about this, these compensation devices when we're looking at feedback machines. And so the way we are going to try to escape this indirect error that changes things is to look at not at the steady state, but rather how cells respond to stimulation. So we're going to look at genetically perturbed cells. For experimental reasons, we cannot do the perturbation immediately around the experiment. We have to let them grow, and so they adapt. We cannot help it right now, although we are trying to find the magic way of getting rid of a certain protein like that and then checking something. It's hard, trust me. So they're growing with this, without this protein for a while. And now we're going to mess with them, OK? And see how they respond. And classical experiments suggest that, and also your intuition as mathematicians, is that the way they respond tells you what happen, kind of breaks some of those feedback mechanisms. Because if the response is faster than the feedback mechanism, for example, you have time to see differences when something is not working properly. Does that make sense to everyone? Or? OK. Classical experiments, single gene study, a lot of the literature is looking at one gene, say galactose, gal, gal, te, gal 1, in a different condition. So it doesn't matter what the mutation here. The point is that they started in a condition where the gene was not expressed. So it's not interesting that the mutant didn't express it either. And when you look after so many hours, five hours, six hours, you don't see a difference. But in the intermediate time, and this what Y here is log scale, so this is a huge difference. The mutant is actually behaving very differently. So at the beginning and the end, it's exactly like the wild type. In the middle, we see the defect. And the reason it reaches this thing is because it's not doing something right. All the feedback machinery say work more, and so eventually it managed to catch up. So we're going to try to look at dynamics and look at the wild type, and then see if the mutant shifts the dynamics, like the example I gave, or changes this, the response, or something like that. And halfway, half an hour into my talk, I reached the end of the introduction. OK. Um, so we're working on yeast. It's a fun organism. It makes beer, bread, and wine. So we try to consume those as much as possible in my lab. Um, especially the wine, which for some reason is not on the slide. But the real reason to work on it is because I'm not a real biologist, and this was the easiest system I, I could work on. And it's experimentally very tractable. Moreover, unlike complicated organisms such as ourselves, many of the players are not appear only once. In humans, everything I mentioned is there are several copies. Each one's specializing, but they can also cover for each other. It's much harder to work with. And so less redundancy means we can perturb the system with single perturbation, not multiple perturbations. And finally, for our problem, when you have a model, it's not just, you know, the model should be simple, but not too simple. In terms of active chromatin, I mentioned that there is also silencing and so on. Yeast does not have silenced chromatin like we do. And so it's a really bad model for that. Uh, but for active chromatin, it actually has most of the pathways that humans have, so it's a great place to start. So what do we do with this yeast? So we're going to take use of the fact that people in the yeast literature have built tons of resources. Uh, maybe we want to close the door there, because there's a lot of ambient noise. Thank you. Um, so one of the things the, the yeast community built is a lot of knockout libraries. Knockout library is a library of strains that where already you know something was knocked out. And we have two types of such knockouts. The first one is, I start with the second one because it's easier. The first one, the, the second one or the first one is simply knockout of genes. Genes are removed and those genes can be writer, reader, players, all kind of things. And just all of the ones that did not kill the yeast, we can work with the knockout strain. The more interesting for our perspective library 
is a library where the histone genes were replaced by copies with usually a single point mutation. So I mentioned before histone 3 lies in 4. Now we have a version where that lies in replaced by alanine, which cannot be methylated. Or actually replaced by arginine, or, or I don't remember what Q is, but those are mutations that maintain the size of the side chain, but, but it changes its sufficient so it cannot be modified. So basically, we're leaving the system intact except the ability to put on this bit or to remove it or to read it. So everything else is fine, okay? So this is a very much finer than knocking out a whole protein that does a lot of things. Okay, so we took all those strains. We grew them, stressed them with oxidative stress. It doesn't really matter for this discussion. And measured the RNA as it was produced for several genes. The technology we used is fancy, but we'll skip it. Essentially, it, mean, it meant that it cost more money, but we didn't have to work hard, and it was very accurate. Um, so let's look at an example. This will make things slightly clearer. This is the RNA going up from very low to high and then back down. This is a typical stress response. There's a stage where you have to produce a lot of protein, and then things relax, and you say, let's slow things down. Minutes, yeah. So this is 90 minute post stress. You see, this is a late gene. It comes up, picks up at 45 genes. Yeast, another nice property is they respond fast. Human cells, you have to work hours. Yeast, an hour and a half was more than enough here. This gene is PGM2. When we look at the mutant where we deleted HDA1, histone deacetylase 1, it's a, uh, as its name suggests, deacetylates uh, histones. We see that the response is much higher and then goes back down. So it's something the, the yeast over, it was jumping in some sense. On the other hand, when we knock down SPT8, which is actually a histone acetylase, uh, we see much more muted response. The thing I want you to notice is that at the beginning, all three variants express the gene more or less the same. And also, at the acclimation stage, where the yeast kind of got used to the fact that we're messing with it, they also express the gene more or less the same. The interesting things happen in the middle. Let's look at another example, just to convince you that I'm not just you know, showing you a single example. Here's a gene that goes down. And here, the two mutants actually flip their behavior. HDA1 represses more, and SPT8 represses less. Uh, but we see more or less the same thing at the beginning and the end. They're very similar. In the middle, we see differences. We are going to focus on these differences and show them in this blue, bluish, yellowish color scheme as yellow, I'm higher than wild type at this point, and blue, I'm lower than wild type. So every, oh, the genes that go up still go up, but not as much, and so on. So, we measure not just one gene, so we are going to switch the thing and look at two-dimensionally. Here are all the genes, the way they respond in wild type. Here's how they respond in three components of the histone deacetylase complex, so HDA1, 2, and 3. They look very much identical. They also look quite similar to wild type. But when we look at the differences, we see a lot of differences. And we already seen this example, but here are a few more. And what we can see is basically that the three HDA proteins that are three different partners in the same complex have very similar effect. This is good news. It's internal control that we are measuring the same thing. And we see that basically by, by genes that go up in wild type tend to go higher in HDA and lower. Genes that go down go lower. OK. Looking at the whole data, things get more complicated. So the whole data is 206 mutants. Each one is four time points, so the stutters you might see are the, the short time series here. And we'll look, question? Which dimension is time? Time is like repeated all over, so you have four columns from each one like we did before. These are the 206 mutants. Here, I showed you four time points, zero, 8, 15, sorry, 15, 45, and 
90. Those are four time points. Now we're going to look at things like that, squished, many of those, 200 and so. Okay? So it's going to look like slightly messier. And there are many things to observe here. Mainly that you look at this data and then you start, it took you three months to collect the data and you're really proud because it was so fast to collect almost 800 experiments in, in three months. But now you're stuck looking at it and trying to figure out what it means. So let's start with some trivial observations. One observation is that if we look at the histogram of changes, the effect of the knockout at time zero, you see a particular distribution. If you look at the effect after 45 minutes, it's a much wider distribution. So indeed, the examples I showed you before that during the response, you see more defects scales. It's not just one single example. OK, so dynamic phenotype is more interesting steady state. Great. So let's try to dig one step deeper. We look at this, and we see that there is a lot of genes that behave like HDA1 did. Basically, the genes that go up tend to go higher, and the genes that go down tend to go down, mm, I don't know, lower. Uh, and we call those hyper-responsive. They over-respond. There's a bunch of other genes that do exactly the opposite. They're hyper-responsive. Now, immediate worry when you see something like that is, OK, this is an artifact. Maybe it has to do with these strains having more, you know, growing faster, suffering from different things, and so on. So these guys are not sluggish because they don't have ATP or something like that. They're sluggish because they have a problem. Some of those strains don't have the right transcription factor to respond to stress, so that makes sense. But others have other things. Interestingly, many of the mutations that are here are mutations that we shouldn't have looked at in the first place. These are mutations in residues that are usually not modified by histone modifiers because they are the interface between the core histone and the DNA that surrounds it. But since we had those in the library, we put them on. And now that means that Basically, these guys suffer from the fact that the nucleosome is not very nice to the DNA. It means that it can be packed probably, but not as well, and it's probably harder to change it, move it, and so on. So these guys suffer from sticky, we suspect, sticky nucleosomes or hard to move nucleosomes. And part of the reason they do not respond is because they cannot change the chromatin. On the other hand, many mutants that are hyper responsive suffer for either from too little nucleosomes because they have defects in the pathway that uh, builds the nucleosomes, or they suffer from high turnover of nucleosomes because there are mutants that lead to that. So in some sense, part of our explanation for hyper-responsiveness is the ability to change your DNA without remembering what you had before. OK, so clearly nucleosome stability is an issue here. We don't understand the mechanism throughout. How much time do I have, roughly? What? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. OK. OK, so I'll let's, let's see how far we go. OK. The next layer of defense, when you look at such a matrix, is to say, OK, do things that should work together group together? I showed you that the three HDA work together. But the question is, are there interesting connections? So we looked at, essentially, we took each one of those four columns that we have for four time points for a mutant, made them into a long vector, and computed correlation. So these two are very different. They are anti-correlated. These two are similar, and these two are similar. OK, so we transform all our mutants to compute the correlation between them. And we got this beautiful matrix where we put all the point mutants in this quadrant, all the knockouts here, and interaction between them in the uh, diagonal, in the off-diagonal things. And so you look at this matrix and say, is it interesting? And the short version, I can pull out 20 years of chromatin biology out of this matrix quite easily because all the, th so the hyper and hyper show up as big clusters, but the smaller clusters are essentially all the complexes we know about, pieces of pathways, and so on. So things on the diagonal are either things that are in the same complex or the same pathway, and we recognize almost all of the pathways that were known in the literature. And things that are off the diagonal are usually 
a complex or a pathway, and it's the residue that it uses to talk with the chromatin. So SIR is a, complex, is a silencing complex, and it works by uh, interacting with K16. And indeed, knockout change of this to something else, or knockout of SIR have very similar effect. Set one is a, already an old friend by now, I hope. This is lysine 4 to alanine, very similar effect. So by looking at these connections, we can connect complexes here to the residues that they interact with in the, in the histones. An interesting example is SET2, because SET2 we know about the, what it modifies, and we have the interaction here. But also the reader of SET2, which is another pathway, also appears here, although I didn't highlight. What happens here? What are those residues that seem to have similar effect? Here we found several things we expected, but some surprises. For example, the knockout changing serine 10 to alanine or changing lysine 4 to alanine, these are those two points along the end of the tail of histon 3, seem to have similar effect. Now we know that serine 10 can be phosphorylated. Again, it doesn't matter what this means, it's a mark. But this mark is associated with centromere, the center of the, the, the attachment point for separating chromatin when we, the cells divide. This one is associated with active transcription. Why the two are having the same effect? Are they related? This is a novel connection that we followed up on, which I won't have time. So basically from this, we can reconstruct pathways or draw them as a network. This is just for to show that we have networks. Um, but where do we go with this? This is, I would claim that so far I didn't do anything that was really interesting. It was very shallow digging in, in, what we, in the data. So we have more interesting stories, and, and I, I want to touch very briefly, without showing you all the data, on one example that we found. So you remember the Lysine 4 that I keep using as a running example? I showed you this description. Now, well, you remember there was a test? Now it's time to remember things. So polymerize to recruit set one, if it's initiating. That puts this methylation mark with some friends. This recruits this guy who recruits acetylase that acetylate those nucleosomes. Now, acetylated nucleosomes are supportive of initiating polymerase two. So this seems like, naively, as a way of initiating pol two to promote more initiation, or in a sense, some kind of positive feedback loop. At least that was my naive interpretation when I first learned about this pathway. Now, there are all kind of branches that feed in, so it's a feedback loop with some you know, different control inputs. But in a sense, it looks like this is a way for active genes to remain active. So what are your, when I show you this, I tell you I'll knock out this I'll mess with this pathway, knock out set one or change this residue so it cannot be methylated. Genes will not be active as much. Short version, wrong. They don't care. What we do find, and I'm jumping a whole bunch of slides because of time, is that re repression of gene response to strengths is sensitive to this pathway. So genes that are highly active and have this mark are not repressed properly if we mess with the cells and don't, have, don't allow them to have this mark. And in fact, we implicate two different pathways that control on one hand ribosomal gene, on the other hand, another set of biosynthesis genes that are involved in this. And again, I'm skipping those results because I want to get to another point before the end of time. But the point is that the interesting things are, is when you look at things, they don't always behave the way we expect. And this returns to the discussion we had before about what did, how did they do the simulation, what it means. So the naive simulation on the kind of diagram does not necessarily mean that this is what happens. So we have some kind of a model, and never mind, but our suspicion is that this methylation is actually kind of a landing point for the repressive complexes to come in and do the repression when they are needed. Um, so I show you the whole bunch of things, and these repeat essentially points I mentioned. But I want to go one step ahead. So um, we already heard 
from the two previous speakers a lot about variability as an important issue in biology. And as these people, we work with cells that are, we know they're genetically identical. We, most of the people in the community, you know, almost all of the classical essays, we look at a whole bunch of cells grinding up, measure RNA. So we're looking at essentially on averages. But when I told you before that I have a mutation that causes the response to be higher, you can think of two different mechanisms by which this can happen. It can be that if this is the wild type, that the mutant responds faster, goes higher or something, all the cells essentially as one do it. Alternatively, if you are willing to believe that there is variability in the population, maybe in the wild type, some of the cells are lazy and do not bother to respond. While in the mutant, they, are kind of, they have a better trigger, they jump higher, whatever. So the po responding population behaves exactly the same. It just is a bigger fraction of the overall population. If you measure averages, I don't need to convince you, we'll see, I can arrange so we'll see similar effects. OK? There are many other possibilities, yeah. So again, for mathematicians, I don't need to say that averages are not telling you the whole story, but this is a motivating example. So how can we look? at single cells and the variability rather than just the average. So the way we go about it is we use this very classical trick by now that you can tag proteins, genes by uh, something that encodes the green fluorescent protein. When the green fluorescent protein is produced, when the gene is transcribed, eventually we get to a protein, the protein will be fluorescent and we can measure that. So the kind of thing we can do, these are yeasts, this is a time-lapse movie of a field of yeast, all those circles of yeast, that turned on a certain gene in response to the stress. Now, it's not the most beautiful movie in the world, and it's not that interesting. We don't see things moving around or fly tumbling or anything like that. But still, we can get a lot of information from this because, because the yeast are stuck to a glass surface here, we can do image analysis and essentially plot the trajectory of induction for each single cell in the population. So now we can start answering question, what happens to variability? And in the three minutes I have, I will show you very, very initial result because we're still learning what to do with this. But I think this is where we can learn a lot of exciting things. So the first thing you can do is remember this plot, PGM2, how it responds, over responds here, under responds there. If we look at the protein levels, because we're measuring proteins, the graphs look similar because protein accumulates while RNA is essentially the derivative of the protein. But the behavior is what we expect. The red one, you generated more RNA, you also generated more protein. SPT8, you generated less RNA, you generated less protein. The time scales here are different. This was done 30 degrees, this was done 23 degrees. This goes back to the temperature sensitivity changing the speed, so let's put that aside. But other than that, this seems to be a good match. In fact, if most of our results, if we compare the RNA, the protein response for different knockouts, different reporters, we see very good qualitative agreement in terms of the direction of the change. So that's kind of a sanity check that the system is more or less right. But what does it tell us? You're starting to look worried, so I'm OK. So one way of looking at it is to try to say, OK, if we measure the protein, can we really reconstruct what happened at the level of the promoter? So here is the, the most naive model I can think of. The promoter is inactive initially. Stress comes along. The promoter is being turned on. To, when it's turned on, we generate RNAs. Eventually, the stress goes away. The promoter is turned off. RNA still stays in the system until it degrades. And let's assume it degrades in kind of a ex simple exponential manner, memory length manner. So the behavior of the RNA is, very, is this shape. And the protein is an integral of the whole thing. This means that if we can see this curve, we might be able to reconstruct this window of when the promoter was active in that particular cell. So here's a real, so this is to start, uh, you know, okay, I mentioned all of this. So here's a real example. These are measurements from a single cell in our field of view, the intensity, the red dots. 
The blue is the best fit of the math that comes out of these. It's not that too complicated, the math. And these are the time points where we think there was productive transcription. I'm not saying that chromatin was uh, open because I don't know what it means. It means that this is the window where we believe new RNAs were coming into the system. And now you can take each and every one of your cells and find this window and plot. Here's a population of cells. These are the accumulation of RNA. This is the windows we reconstructed using this fit. And this is just to show you that the fit is actually pretty supportive of the data. And since before Nama pulls me off, I'll just finish this example. So we can look at, for example, the onset and off, the on and off distribution in wild type. And here is a mutant that clearly shifted the time scale to the left very much. HDA1 or 2, they behave the same that I mentioned before, actually is over producing RNAs. But in terms of opening and closing time, and also the, the duration things are open, it's virtually indistinguishable from the wild type. So clearly, the mechanism by which YTA7 leads to more production is different than what HDA2 does. So apparently, this has to do with more transcription when it's open, and this has to do with totally different dynamics. So I find this ex super exciting in terms of looking for the future of trying to understand mechanism from such measurement, but there are many obstacles. Um, so we build a system to do this in high throughput manner, so hopefully we'll be able to do uh, in parallel a lot of time-lapse experiments, and we're actually doing now, so talking about thousands of these time-lapse usually should take you less than a week. Doing 100,000 should take you a month. We're not there yet for the 100,000, but we're working. And essentially, this is where I'm learning about control theory because the way we do it is a lot of robotics. And here I have a complaint for you engineers that in, 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 uh, in movies, the helicopters fly really well. The actual piece of devices we get when we buy them for commercial companies are not doing so well. So this thing works really nice, but I'll shift something by one millimeter and havoc, you know, everything goes to hell. Um, so, but basically this system allows us to grow yeast in multi-tighter plates, measure their growth, dilute them so we get all of them at the end of the, the at the time of the experiment the same place, and do all kind of manipulation, and I think I'll stop with the moving running because I run out of time. So thank you very much.